Okay, good morning or good evening, everybody, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thanks for celebrating 920 with us. We're really happy you're here, that you're willing to take the time to celebrate the myth, magic, science, and culture of the sacred mushroom. I couldn't be happier to introduce our next guest, Francoise. A little bit about Francoise is that she uses a variety of techniques for expanding for accessing expanded states of consciousness to explore human potential beyond the personality construct and connect with a larger sense of self. She translates these experiences through the various aspects of life, leading to a creative participa participation in the human family. She teaches professionals healing arts as a method for using this work in the context of their practices to help their clients heal, grow, and transform. She shares her worldview inspired by her personal experiences and explorations with entheogens and how they impact our everyday life. She has a passion for furthering this work and lectures at universities and conferences internationally, as well as being an adjunct faculty at the California Institute of Integral Studies in California. And she recently published her book with Christina Hunter called Consciousness Medicine. Thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. I, um, I'm just going to go ahead and start with my, uh, my lecture. Let, let so, us, let uh, thank you. For, all right. So, um, thank you for all of you who have joined in the chat. It's so lo lovely to see people from different places of the world. I'm uh, zooming from south of France right now. I'm visiting my family and, uh, and doing some, uh, some teaching and training as well. Um, so it's 10 p.m. for me, uh, French time. Um, you know, I've been uh, I've been in this work with entheogens and various uh, expanded state of consciousness for the last over 30 years since I um, arrived in San Francisco and met very interesting people. Uh, some of them like Ralph Metzner or Ramdas and different people, and then and then uh, some medicine people who took me under their wings, so to speak, uh, for my personal process with uh, medicines and different techniques of expanding consciousness, I found that very fruitful, very uh, powerful, very uh, transformative for me. I was dealing with some trauma, I was dealing with some childhood stories and, well, you know, confusion of life, I should say. And it was really fabulous for me to find so much transformation in this method. Uh, so I decided to pursue my uh, my training and become a, a therapist. So I did a master's in somatic psychology and then um, a training in Hakomi therapy and became a And uh, with this man who do this journey were involving various substances, including uh, mushrooms. And... Uh, and then a few years later, I was uh, able to go to what was like Jimenez and really uh, were, was able to partake, of course, into ceremonies and with the veladas, as they call them, and to, uh, to experience the work firsthand, so to speak. And then over many years, over 20 years, I was very woven in with the family there and still, in, still am. Um, and I've been able to sort of study the practice uh, of the Mazatec tradition. You know, I'm not a Mazatec person and will pretend to be one. It's just a possible task or impossible aim or it's a bit arrogant. But um, but I've really uh, been able to be accepted in that family. I really, uh, walk the walks of the mountain and go to the, the power place, Chico Nindo, which Oliver, you must know very well, of course. And... and uh, the caves and the waterfalls and such powerful land there. And uh, study was this woman uh, who passed away last year, Julieta Casimiro. She was one of the 13 indigenous grandmothers. Maybe some of you may know of her or have met her. And uh, so I studied with her. I traveled the world with her. She came to California quite a, quite a few times and did some conferences at CIS and vacations and all that. So. It was, uh, it was really a privilege to be able to work close to her. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about what, again, what I've observed in a very humble, you know, unpretentious, uh, you know, uh, way because it's, it's about, like I said, it's impossible to really feel like 
you know, I know much about the Mazatec, but you know, there is the ceremonies themselves and the mushrooms that they use, the various mushrooms they use, and how they handle the ceremony. And but before that, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the various rituals that surrounds the ceremony itself and the way they um, prepare themselves in a way uh, which is very instructive for us, because. You know, in the West or in the North, however, in the industrialized world, we tend to we tend to you know, use the mushroom, oh, but which is fine. But we don't surround it very much with ritual and other kinds of practices. And in watching them, um, I think it's it, it's a good way to um, uh, witness what a culture does in relation to the ceremony itself before it even happens. And of course, uh, what they do afterwards. So before the ceremony is what I've noticed, uh, there's a lot of what they call limpias, right? A lot of cleansing. They cleanse the house every day with this copal that they burn in this large round copaleros, this black, uh, black pottery, black raw, raw earth pottery, and they and they cleanse the house every day. And they have this ritual of really tending to their space. So they consider the space a, holiday, a place of a place of ritual. So they clean it constantly. So there's a lot of passages to a house, and you go from the street into the house, and they can a sacred space, and so they clean it every day, and a few times a day, but for sure in the morning. And then they um, they do offerings. So they do offerings. Uh, they do offerings to sacred spaces, uh, especially to Chico Nindo, which is. Uh, the, the sort of the, the power place, the the guardians, the spirit guardian, guardian spirit of the whole of the whole mountain and of the whole Mazatec region, and so they uh, they, they they hike for 45 minutes and go up to this place and they offer um, cocoa beans, which is a traditional currency for the Mazatec uh, for, uh, for for offering. So they put cocoa beans on the land, they, uh, they burn copal, they offer candles. So this, they offer the prayers, they offer their, um, their songs and meditations and ask for support and they connect with really the spirit of the land, which is a very beautiful practice and tradition which we, we don't always seem to be remembering in our more modern um, life. Um, they do, uh, to go back to Olympia, so they, they, they clean the space, but they also clean themselves. And they, every time they put the copal, they'll put it on their body and they'll brush the energy out. So they're, um, they'll surround themselves with the, with the cleansing. And that's true also in the church, for those of you who may have gone to Otla to, to Mass there, which is by itself a whole ritual, which we're going to talk about it because there's a lot of, um, oh, someone says there's a lot of static. Should I do something different? Um, I'm going to let you guide me through it, Daniel. If there's something. Oh, the mic is just touching my. Of, I think it's okay. just a function of maybe being in a hotel. Okay. Is that better? Does oh, that that's feel... actually better. That's definitely okay. better. All right. Away from the body. In the, on the... Okay. I'm just going to be that. <laughs> Great. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, so. Yeah, so the, the practice of limpia is really, uh, with the kopal, is really happening in many different areas of life. With the house, like I said, and the church, when people enter, there's this ritual at some point in the mass of, of the kopal being burned. And then, of course, as they enter the room of the ceremony, the, um, the curandera, the leader of the ceremony, will put the kopalero on the floor, have some bunches of special uh, of a precious special shrub that they cut um, and then they uh, they they pass the sh these branches above the copal and then they brush the body very thoroughly while praying in Mazatec before the person enters the space and um, go uh, sit in her or his spot so the limpias are very very uh, important and I find that really interesting to see how we um, in our culture, take care of not the way we transition between or in our home to a sacred space, to a sacred uh, ceremony spot. 
So that's very interesting for me. And some of my, you know, my interest in my work here, I'm describing these things, but a lot of my interest is how do we translate those practices into, um, into our way of life and how we can absorb and borrow very respectfully, of course, but learn from these practices how to, how to take care of this um, cleansing, of these offerings like this, and, and see the benefits of those, um, of those rituals themselves. The other uh, thing that is very practiced in, uh, in old love, um, and I've been very touched by that very personally, is the divination process. So there are some people there who are reading um, the corn, the corn kernels that they throw on a piece of cloth, or they read the copal smoke, or they'll put eggs on the body and then break it and read uh, the content of the egg to... Uh, divine or, or guess or um, yeah, do some divination around the, the illness or the blockage that might be uh, present in someone's life or body or energy or past. Sometimes it's having to do with memories or other you know childhood um, trauma, and it's really uncanny how um, people like that have have been able to seriously um, diagnose or say things to the people I've taken there in a very, very accurate way. I mean, this is really strange, but, you know, those are the, the gifts that they have. And the people who are doing the divinations are always saying that um, those gifts are achievable and they can be learned and they can be asked for by, uh, to the mushroom, from the mushrooms. And so it's interesting that there's actually a, a ask, a, a way to acquire some skills and techniques um, that are part of this mushroom cosmology that they feel uh, we, as even Westerners, can, um, can acquire. Um, another, <coughs> excuse me, another technique I found really uh, interesting that goes with the divination that I was talking about with the, with the corn especially, because that's the man I, I've been working with for uh, many years. Uh, it's the process of what they call pagos. So this process of pago is, a, um, um, is the way to pay, this is what pago means, to pay the spirits of various territories, various areas, to um, ask them permission to unblock certain parts of our energy. So for example, um, when I was just there, there was a woman who was with me and this man threw the corn and saw that there were blockage from certain places in her childhood, which he didn't know anything about and her, his read was very accurate. And he also diagnosed that these places of, uh, uh, of her early childhood difficulty, these places were actually creating some fear, which she knew about, of course, but some fear that was blocking the uh, entry into the mushroom territory, according to his read. So he suggested a pago, and a pago is a series of bundles of 100 cocoa beans mixed with an egg, mixed with copal, mixed with um, a little feather and a little amate, a little uh, bark, uh, a bark of a tree, and uh, and some some pedri freshly tobacco. And this is wrapped, this is a bundle that is wrapped, then that is placed to the tunes of various spirits of the land. So uh, it can be, uh, you know, the cemetery or Chikonin spirit place I was talking, can be a bridge over the river, it's called Puente de Fierro. Um, it can be um, the caves, it can be um, the place from which the person is from, so it's generally the States or Europe. Um, and after this pago is done, then according to this man, the spirits of these places are then uh, fed or paid, and so the, the journey happens in a more smooth way. That's the idea. And the, the path is open and there's a liberation of of the energy. So those are very interesting, um, 
interesting rituals, of course. Uh, there's rituals also with candles, and they have the beeswax candles that they make there, and so they use those beeswax candles at the church, of course, but also at altars, at Chikonindo, and they uh, they light a candle at the beginning of the corn reading to uh, carry this, the spirit and the flame of the person and to uh, orient the reading. So all these uh, all these practices are uh, very present in um, in in the way the Mazatecs have um, approached uh, the rituals of the mushroom. So for them, it's not just about going to mushrooms. This is only almost like the end of it. But all this preparation, all this cleansing, all this awareness towards one's um, blockage, all this, all these offerings, all this. This way of preparing oneself is is inherent to the ceremony. It's, it's part of the ceremony, uh, and that's something we can definitely learn from. Of course, another part of the of the the preparation for ceremonies there, which I find interesting, is the diet. So the Mazatecs uh, have a uh, a strong uh, belief that it's important for people approaching mushroom and exiting mushroom uh, space to be in a sexual diet. They consider uh, the preparation of, uh, of of saving one's energy, of being really with oneself and not with someone else's energy in the space, very important. So they recommend uh, five days of sexual diet before and five days later uh, to be, I guess, regrouping and being um, with one's return and one's um, acknowledgement of what has taken place and the various uh, aspects of the ceremony that have been opening up and all that. So, so uh, they have this sexual diet, um, and uh, they also uh, don't eat meat the day of the journey. Um, it's important for them not to have um, what they call dead body inside uh, inside inside them. Um, they have something interesting, which I'm going to say now because I'm afraid to, to forget later. Uh, they feel that after a ceremony, it is important for people not to go in a cemetery because they believe that um, if there is someone, what they call a fresh dead body, someone who is just buried, um, it would um, compromise the healthy return into one's energy. It's a little bit like the sexual diet thing that you are with yourself and you're not merged with someone else. And, you know, for them, the people who are going into the other side, right, or people who are dying are actually in a space that is the space of the journey. Huh? That's the space of the ancestors, that's the soul, the space of the dead is very much the space of the journey. It's beyond the veil. And so they... Uh, they don't want to uh, mess up <laughs> your personal space of, of coming back from behind the veil. And if someone has just died, then they are on the they're crossing over on the other side of the veil. So um, you know they, they don't they don't want us to. If we if we after a journey we don't go to the cemetery, we go to the cemetery before a journey. That's okay, but not after. Um, so you know we pay attention to those recommendations and the way they. They treat uh, this very important uh, piece of their life, which is the relationship with the ancestors and the, the realm of the dead. So this is my first part, Daniel and everybody, about this, uh, what I call the beyond the ceremonies. Um, and then uh, if you have some questions and some curiosity, then I'm happy to address that. And I'll go more into the ceremony itself and uh, how they deal with the mushrooms. Well, I definitely have a, a few questions. Great. Um, so what I heard is there's this, uh, this cleansing process, right? The yes. process. And then there are these offerings. Mm -hmm. um, and there are, you know, a couple, and then there's some diet and some abstinence and things mm -hmm. like that. And I'm curious mm -hmm. how those practices have made their way into your life when you're, I don't know, running around or living your life in America or Europe or places like that. Yes, they have very much made their way into my life. I feel like these uh, practices for myself are important around my own personal practice. Um, the cleansing is, have been, has been really important, but it was, I mean, it's, uh, I think that I was already 
uh, doing that before I went to Mexico because of the medicine men I was working with. But yeah, the process of cleansing and offering and having an altar and putting things on my altar and watching what I eat around my uh, practice with entheogens has been has been there for many many years. It, it got really sort of a, uh, a very cons consolidated, affirmed, and and solidified. You know, when I went to Mexico because I saw how um, important it was. But um, you know, the the practice of having sacred space, of having a, a you know relationship with my body in a certain way, and all those all those practices were were there but they yeah they got very very solidified by my uh, time in Wotla. Mm -hmm. and so if somebody was going to so if, let's say somebody is listening to this and they sort of feel like oh i should probably work something like that into my personal practice they maybe don't have access to a curandero or a shaman or even an assisted therapist but they have a personal practice or they, you know, some group, some friends or things like that, and they want to add ceremonial aspects to it, what would you suggest? Well, I would suggest that uh, there be an altar with some, uh, that's what I'm saying in my book, you know, that's what I describe a lot. I think that the presence of an altar as a reflection of what is sacred or what is precious to people, it doesn't have to be anything, you know, of Buddhism or Christianity, whatever, whatever it can be a, a nat nature altar, right? Um, uh, I mean, I do my practice a lot in nature personally, so you know it's enough to put, uh, you know, some some leaves together on the ground or some uh, some 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 um, signal of a sacred space. Mm -hmm. um, it's important, yeah, to have some. Um, sage or incense or copal whatever is available it doesn't have to be all the same items exactly like the mazatec i mean we don't have a lot of cocoa beans here right but we have tobacco or we have cornmeal or we have uh water or we have you know various things that we can use for offering the the action is not so much uh in the exactitude of the object it's more the intention and what we what we mean to paying respect to to the land so yeah doing a big an altar doing some cleansing brushing one's body with leaves you know we want to be um you know it's one thing to copy and play the gimmick it's another thing to mean it i think it's all in the intention if you intend to cleanse your body you can do it with your hands i mean i remember working with ralph metzner and he was doing exactly what you're doing he was just cleanse his body with his hands all the way to the ground and visualizing moving this other layers of himself that he brought from the street onto the ground and he would do that and it was i remember him guiding me through this and I'm like okay i feel the difference yeah. and i was even taught to do it with sound so it was like whoosh, 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 whoosh. yeah and it was so <laughs> with sounds with songs you can have a song you can have a special song that you sing when you do this ritual or when you enter the space of ceremony it can be a song you make up. It can be a lullaby from your childhood. It can be anything, you know. It's the, it's it's what it uh, what it uh, crystallizes for you, right? So it's right. A, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so back to you know the traditional Mazatec, uh, are there mental preparations they use like meditation or mindful breathing? Haley would like to know. Okay. Uh, no, they use prayer. They're mm -hmm. very very religious they're very devoted christian um i want to say a little piece about that because uh you know there has been some mm, judgment or resistance which is very legitimate i'm a reformed catholic myself i know exactly what it's like to have escaped uh, the uh, oppress oppressive uh, Catholic Church as a as a woman and as a French woman, it was pretty uh, radical, and so I understand that. And yet, um, a lot of the people who go to Outla, what they what they really come back with is learning to pray. It's a very interesting thing. You can pray to the tree, you can pray to the Mother Earth, you can pray to the sky, you can pray to the Guadalupe or Tanansin, or you, the Earth Goddess there. You can pray to um, to Buddha, you can pray to uh, 
energies and sacred light or the force or whatever. You know, you can pray to God, you can pray to Jesus, whatever. But the relationship one has with another um, level of, uh, I want to say, beingness or pure light or you know this this layer of consciousness that we reach when we are in this entheogenic space um so they prepare with prayer and when they pray uh they pray to jesus mary and god and for them you know god is the divine mary is the earth and jesus is the mushroom jesus is the messenger the mushrooms are the messengers from the divine into our body or from the earth through our body into the great expansion of the divine so the mushrooms are a communion they're like they're like the bread and blood of, i mean they're like the bread they're like the holy bread in fact all the songs that they sing has to do is eating the holy bread of transformation right and you know it's catholic songs but you translate that into the mushroom, you transpose bread into mushroom, or Jesus into mushroom, or God into gall, whatever, the divine, and then you have it. Or you transform Mary into the earth and you have it. And when they pray, they pray to Mary, Mother Earth, Mother Sky, Mother, Mother, Mother Moon. And it's all about the divine mother, the divine feminine that grows all these mushrooms for our communion with the divine. So it's a, the overlap is very, very interesting to see the symbology of Catholic um, uh, words and, and, and archetypes almost. Um, I find that extremely moving because when they start to, uh, to pray and you transpose or you imagine that they pray to the, to the mushroom and to God, it really works. I don't hear you anymore. Oh, I, okay. I was just uh -huh. saying that that's gorgeous. I mean, I just, I love devotion regardless of tradition. And I, I just feel like for me when, you know, I have no shortage of shadow. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I got, I, got, I got problems. My problems have problems. And I find that the thing that eases the path of that every time is, is devotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, they're very... Uh, is it, the devotion is both relational, they really relate to the entities to which they pray. And they have like this, yeah, they have a relationship. They can pray, they can beg, they can be on their knees, really suffering. They can also be in dynamic relationship. It's, it's not at all a, a passivity or, or sometimes they say, I'm lost, help me. But, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's very multi-layered. I'm, I'm trying to see... Uh, what people are saying. Um, Would you like me to read Arlen's uh, question? Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, actually, I want to wait because I think I feel like you might cover that, and I want to stay with the the ceremonial okay. stuff. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Kate said you mentioned abstaining from meat on the day of the ceremony. What are the other preparations the Mazatec mm -hmm. do or take in in the hours leading up to the ceremony? Uh, they. Um, they hold silence. Mm. They focus. They uh, they pray internally, or they close their eyes. They go inside. They see why they're doing the ceremony, what is their intention, what brings them there. Um, if they're gonna do ceremony with each other, they um, um, they talk about how they're going to do the ceremony or I know some families have done ceremonies together, you know, parents and children and they, um, they bond, they bond before the ceremony. Um, in my, in my retreats, I, um, uh, organize there. People are very, very quiet before ceremonies. They meditate or they do some yoga or they just stay still and they focus on their intention. Maybe they do some writing. Um, and they stay still and they're quiet and not a lot of chit chat and really right yeah not no pot of course no 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 pot smoking during the entire retreat i lead because i really want people to be very very focused on their on their the nuance of their um 
and we don't drink alcohol and we don't smoke pot at all. That's very important for them, for the Mazatec, to be really sober, to be really clear and clean and attentive. Do they smoke cannabis like the rest of the time? Like, no, is it, they is never smoke cannabis. Smoking? No, they don't smoke. The, yeah. the Mazatec don't smoke cannabis. It's really not at all a tradition. It was there during the time of Maria Sabina. There was a lot of cannabis there. Um, that's what the hippies brought cannabis, uh, which was, uh, and she, Maria Sabina really liked her cannabis, um, I heard. But um, no, it's not at all a, a medicine that is part of the culture there. Got it. Because they do, you know, they they do the mushroom and then they do the salvia and then they'll do the morning glory seeds. So, you know, they're, they're busy. <laughs> Right, <laughs> they're busy, you know, and, and, and they don't do. Never, we never even talk about that. I mean, we're, we're we've we've got to wait for like the morning glory seed renaissance. Yep, that hasn't happened yet. The salvia, the salvia is more happening, uh, yeah. but uh, but the morning glory seed is still a uh, uncharted territory. Right, it's very interesting. It's very interesting practice, though. I really like it, but it's it's to be, it's, it deserves to be known. <laughs> Right. Yeah. That's a, that's a whole other summit. Yeah, totally. Um, so this Arwen has this question that might sort of take us into a new direction out, out of the ceremony and more into your relationship with the community. He's curious, how you, did you initiate your relationship with the community and how did you manage to have them so interested to share their processes with you? We often read that Gordon Wasson was sworn to secrecy and had to lie about lie about it to his son to even access the medicine it seems equally now if it is a commodity to be sold to those interested mm -hmm. well that's a very very important question i think that at the time when maria sabina was asked to sit for wesson and roger heim uh, there hadn't been anybody there really um approaching the mazatec and um you know it's hard to know if maria sabina was really bribed or paid very poorly or 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 to to sort of uh, sit for these guys which she paid very harshly for you know she you know her house was burned her son was murdered the whole town was really horribly um shocked it was very hard for her um my friend julieta knew her very well and was saying that uh, they call her the pobrecita you know the poor little one who suffered from what she did um, so that was then, uh, the hippies came and went and the town became quiet again. There's not a lot of people coming through. It was pretty quiet. You know, I got there, you know, in 97 or something like that. Um, and there were very few tourists going. I was, I was brought there because... I had met this man, this Mexican man, who had uh, German Mexican actually, who had uh, lived in Wautla for ten years, um, between twenty and the age of twenty and twenty-eight or something. He had been there when he was a teenager, and uh, was adopted by Julieta as one of the hippies that she tried to protect uh, from the from the police. Um, and uh, I, when I met uh, this man, he. Uh, he knew, he knew I was interested in the topic because I had been working with this other medicine man and he decided to take me there and uh, to introduce me to Julieta because he felt that was an important meeting for both of us, each of us. So I got there and um, and she uh, somehow took me seriously and wanted to share with me a lot. And she, um, I, you know, I didn't really want to be I don't know, like the special one or something. I was just really glad and fortunate to sit at the, at all, you know, at her altar and and for her to agree to work with me. Um, she had suffered a lot also from protecting the hippies in the seventies and had gone to jail and things like this. So I I know she, I know it was um, risky for her, but somehow it was later, of course, much later than Maria Sabina, and I think that the time was probably right or she felt it was right to share what she shared and i think that maria sabina actually it's hard to know if she was bribed to or paid for sitting or if she had some uh, you know i don't know some vision or intuition that it was time for the mushroom to go out of of Wautla. 
I don't know. It's a, it's a mystery. Everybody's destiny is so unique. So when I worked with Julieta, she, um, she told me a few times that I, I was, uh, uh, she considered me an interpreter. And I was asking her what that meant because, you know, I'm, I'm, not some, I'm not someone who wants to steal things from people or take, you know, uh, I mean, I, I think I can create rituals without having to copy Mazatec things necessarily. I mean, I've been immersed in Native American ritual for a long time uh, also and before that actually. And with people who are close to me, like other people who are close to me. And and uh, and she said, no, 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 I want you to, I want you to learn and I want you to talk to your people about what we're doing in your words. So that became sort of the, I don't know, uh, um, I, I, she asked me, you know, she asked me to, to, to share. She asked me to share and she, you know, trusted that I would be doing that in, in, in a way that was respectful. So I guess, uh, that's what I'm doing, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's really important to address this um, cultural inappropriation, you know, or misappropriation, um, and that it's it's uh, you know uh, taking from a tradition like that one is a very uh, meaningful moment and. Borrowing is is a meaningful moment, and we have to be very careful how we honor them, how we give back to them, as we support them. You know, it's not just taking and leaving; it's taking and giving. Well, can I can I ask you to talk more about that idea of reciprocity and giving back and things of that nature? Sure. You know, um, when Julieta and I met. Um, Oh, well, actually, much later, before she died, actually, before she died, uh, a, a year and a half ago in July, we were talking, and um, I was expressing my gratitude for um, what she had given me, an amazing amount of uh, knowledge and wisdom and permission and, and generosity, and I felt like part of the family, and I am very much part of the family, according to the family, <laughs> Um you know, the kids I've seen walk to my legs, you know, the grandkids, the, 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 the people who have suffered. And I think that I think that the way to give back is to give. Um, I'm supporting one of the children to go to school. I'm, uh, you know, I'm supporting various activities and endeavors, the health of someone, the education of someone else. I give back. I I give back. I invite them here, uh, well, in France, I invite them in France to share ceremonies or to um, to different places. I've taken Julieta and her daughter to Israel to go on the step of Jesus to do a whole pilgrimage for twice, you know, first with Julieta and then with Eugenia and to meet my friends there. I have a big community there of people. You know, I give them a forum to talk at CIS. I did a big conference for them to explain their tradition to have to hold this beautiful uh, cocoa beans ritual to the Guadalupe so I showcase them for them to be able to uh, to teach and share their own vibration to the world so there's what we can give financially and there's what we can give as far as bringing them into the world and Julieta went into the grandmothers because I was knowing some people who were organizing the grandmothers council and before she died she said you know um uh, I gave you my world, but you give you gave me your world, and by that, she, and I knew what she meant. I mean, and I said to her, "You gave me the inner world, and I gave you the outer world," and that was really that exchange. I mean, I, I mean, I don't know. There's no way to be grateful enough for what she had uh, given me in terms of the vastness of the inner world that she took me in and taught me how to do this work. Um, and at the same time, I brought her into the world, and she went to India, and she went to Kathmandu, and she went to Alaska, and she went to Sundance with the Lakotas. I mean, things that she, other people's prayer that she was being invited to and able to partake. And for her, that was really, um, that was really a great union of uh, of prayer for women, especially. So that's really interesting. What was it like? What did you witness as far as 
her interacting with the with the spirituality and the ceremony of of other cultures i found her extremely comfortable extremely curious i mean she would drink her ayahuasca she would drink a peyote she would i mean she didn't take iboga but it was just about that you know because she didn't go to africa to gabon when that was organized because uh, there was Ebola and she was scared at the time, um, even though it was not that close. But um, she was, when we went to Tibet, uh, to uh, Dharamsala, to India together, to visit the Dalai Lama, whom she made personally. And um, she was totally confident in her own prayer and her own strength as a medicine woman. She had this wonderful clothes full of mushrooms and, you know, embroideries and everything. And she would, she would like be totally regal in her own uh, medicine and was very respected for that. And all the grandmothers came to Wautla. We had a gathering of 100 people in Wautla uh, in 2004 or six, 2006. Um, and uh, 100 people descended on Wautla, the Cheyenne, the, the, Kat, the Nepalese shaman, the Tibetan grandmothers, the Brazilian ayahuasqueras, the, Yupik Eskimo grandmother, they all came, the Hopi, the Cheyenne, the Lakota, they all came down to Wautla and did ceremonies with her. And they all took the mushroom with her and they all saw what she was about and how potent she was and how meaningful she was. So anything after that was, she was like respected. And when she went to India, when she went to the Sundance, she was curious and she was really getting, digging, you know, really the potency of each woman's prayer and she was appreciating that and she saw the un uniqueness of it and the um the magic of it the potency of it she was totally um blown away and felt a sense of great solidarity with other powerful women in the world praying and holding ceremonies like she she did gorgeous um how has your work with her informed your client your client work and and ultimately your your new book hmm. well um uh, i think i feel that my relationship with the sacred and my own presencing with other layers of reality have become more acquired, more um, integrated. I don't know quite how to say it, but it's more a lifestyle than it is in a technique. It's more something I believe in or I, I live. Um, I reflect that or I, don't, I guess, you know, we are, we're, you know, the medicine is who we are, right? The medicine is not so much what's in the plate. That's what Julieta said. The medicine is not what's in the plates the vibration you are with it right so um so i feel like the, the, by, by immersing myself there over and over again over over 20 something years i've been um sort of vibrating differently almost it has kind of gotten into me and now when i work with people i reflect back the bigger picture the compassion maybe the acceptance of the process which can be very complex around exploring expanded states of consciousness, um, the nitty gritty of how to conduct oneself around ceremony, during ceremony, uh, uh, has been more refined and more, um, uh, yeah, more, more adjusted to, uh, uh, so when I go to Mexico and I, and I work there, um, I worked there with the family, you know, I mean, Julieta and I used to work together. I mean, it was her work and then I would be there with her and I would do the work with her. And I mean, it was mostly her work, but I worked a lot with her too. So, you know, the, all the techniques that have been um, learned there as far as cleansing and even some techniques that have grew in me, like a lot of extraction techniques have been um, uh, part of my work now. So I do a lot of extraction. Um, uh, on people energetically and things that I take out of people's body. <laughs> it's kind of what happens in, in moments, you know. And, uh, so, yeah. 
that has affected my work a lot. The, you know what has reflect, affected my work a lot I th uh, from being there is my relationship with nature. It was very much there. I live in the woods and you know nature is very much part of my sanity, I should say. I grow my food and have bees and things like this but 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 being there with the Mazatecs who you know make their coffee and have their honey and grow their food and go get the woods to cook that immediacy and the relationship with the plants and the herbs and the healing with all the herbs has been a lot more present for me and a lot more part of my my um, my work and my life. So I do a lot of wilderness uh, work, a lot of work in wilderness. Very, very cool. Um, I guess... <laughs> I mean, I do. I want to. I would like to go into into your practice. We could probably talk for another hour just about the fact that you use the word extractions. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a loaded word. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, it's good. I mean, I I, I, I do them too. I get it. Um, okay. Is good. there um, team Adelic? So the Adelic Psychedelic Society in Eugene, Oregon, is is really nice. They have a community library and a community garden and things like that they would like to know is there a role that money plays within the ceremonies you are discussing is there a way to conduct non-commodified ceremonies that you are familiar with well you know the reality is that uh in Wautla, the people who are conducting conducting ceremony are specialized in that skill and that's what they do and that's what they're paid for and that's what the living is they don't have a job you know they they do only that they dedicate their life to holding the space to keeping a lifestyle that is appropriate for ceremony they have a very strong spiritual practice and uh and so they get paid for the ceremony i mean if I go see a body worker or an acupuncturist, you know, I'm not expecting to be treated for free. Or if I go see a spiritual counselor even, or a psychologist or, you know, someone who has dedicated their life learning a skill and a trade, I'm, I'm expecting to um, offer something, you know. So sometimes it's money and sometimes it can be other things. But for them, you know, to be able to continue doing their work the way they do, they, they, they can't have another job. This is all they do. Um, you know, Maria Sabina was growing some corn and then later on she was not able to work, but, um, yeah, having some animals, some chickens, some goats, you know, <laughs> so, I mean, the idea, the idea of, of those ceremonies being expected, uh, as the, you know, for free is, 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 uh, is complicated for them. This is their, you know, this is their activity and this is what they do. Right. It is, it is interesting as a, I taught yoga for many years and that's another job that sometimes people think you should just do for free. Um, and it's, 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 uh, it's, it's kind of more complex than that in, yes. in the modern world. Yes. Yes. I mean, I do my yoga and I know what it takes for my teacher to become as skilled as he is. It takes, you know, retreats in India, a month at a time. It takes a lot of, a lot of, a lot of learning. It takes doing nothing else but that. Mm -hmm. I can't expect him to teach my class for free. I mean, I'm happy. In fact, I'm happy to support him so he can continue doing what he's doing so well. So it's really, uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's like, uh, like you're saying, it's, it's energy, you know, yeah, it's, I'm happy to pay my, my oh, Julieta or her daughter. I'm happy to see this work continue and I'm happy mm -hmm. to support that because it's well done. And I'm happy it's happening, <laughs> you know. It's almost like the, I think about, you know, it's sort of karma yoga meets bhakti yoga. Yeah. Right? It's like exactly. offering the work as selfless service, but I want to do it to, for somebody who is devoted enough to offer. That's right. So I know that's, that's right. a paradox, but, you know, it's like yeah. devote, you yeah. know, devotion meets service. I mean, in my practice, someone wants to work with me, if they have money, they'll pay me. If they don't have money, they don't pay me. Mm -hmm. I'll work anyway. I will work with people who don't have money because that's my value. That's my morality. I want to support, you know, 
I want to support people. And the people I train are people who are committed to support people no matter what. Right. So it's a value. Uh -oh. Arwin's, it's a, it's Arwin's a, on his way to France to see you, he says. <laughs> I'm coming, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> so tell maybe we have a few more minutes left. Tell us where we can find you, how to get in touch with you. Tell us maybe a little bit more about your book. Okay. Well, okay. So my book is called Consciousness Medicine. It was, it was, it came out because I was doing this uh, classes at CIS. I was, I was teaching a class called Expanded State of Consciousness and Psychotherapy, which I was interested in, you know, certainly uh, psychedelics, especially mushroom, but also, you know, what does it mean to lead rituals? What does it mean to, to organize a retreat for people with movement or with meditation or with nature or vision quest or sweat lodge or meditation. I mean, there's so many techniques that take people outside of their everyday life. So I was interested in that. So I taught a class in that with a lot of focus on preparation and a holistic model. And um, what does that mean to, uh, to identify what happens in an experience and how to support it in integration. So, I was I was uh, I, I was interested in that. So, my assistant Christina Hunter, my co-author, I should say, uh, she um, she recorded all my lectures and transcribed them. So that became the book. That became the material for the book. And I'm really glad actually because uh, um, I was able to to talk about what I witnessed in the Mazatec tradition, how that can be you know, adapted or transcribed into our life of more industrialized world and the value of community, of looking at the environment and nature as a whole organism and how these medicines or this vision quest can really take us into those those things. So the book is about that. It's about a, a bridge between um, indigenous culture and, um, and uh, indigenous culture and a more like psychological framework of you know, working with people with trauma, this is hard, you know, and working with people with, with the desire for growth and expansion. So if you want to find me, you can uh, go on my website, which is uh, my name, francoiseborza.com. And then you'll find um, my, uh, my book, you'll find my, uh, my story, you'll find my music. I have some CDs of medicine songs that, I, um, that I've collected and invented and or collected and record it so you can listen to that when you journey and see if you want um, collected, collected them from from the ethers exactly some from the ether some from Wautla some of them are in Mazatec some of them are in Spanish some of them are in Hebrew because I have a whole thing of my Israeli family there my husband and his family some in French some in English so it's a, it's a variety of languages that are really unifying the human family so I I believe in unity and 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 and, un and uniqueness at the same time. So, so that's the book, and uh, I'm going to set up an online course soon, uh, so people can find me. And if they want to deepen their curiosity around my work, they can they can do some of that, which is actually uh, quite interesting. And um, yeah, yeah. And I have some interviews, some articles that came from into maps or chakruna with Bial Labate. There was an article that came and some, uh, I'm going to be at uh, various conferences in New York and LA again and like that. So you can, you can find on my calendar if you want to find me where I am and like that. Right on. Well, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, this was, this oh, was a joy. You. It was really eye opening and informative. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much for having me. You know, we hear that this has been amazing. Somebody says it's amazing. <laughs> um, and oh. so, yeah, we'll have to do it again sometime. Okay, Daniel. Good job. Thank you so much for organizing the summit. I'm really happy to see all the other speakers that were on the, on the schedule. It sounded really a great, great, wonderful, uh, wonderful group. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really honored to be part of it. Wonderful. Cool. Yeah, so far so good. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.